and that is the conflict over our own mind and to make an effort to defeat our mind and uh, when you realize that then you stop looking outside but then you focus on what can be done within and there is a lot of work within the problem is no one is looking inside once you look inside you will find a ton of you know work available for you to control your mind senses emotions and therefore you know uh we should be competing with our own versions of ourselves and try to get become better versions of ourselves and that's the whole idea okay well i'm delighted to be joined again on the show by garanga das for his second appearance on the freedom park podcast welcome to the show it's a pleasure to speak to you again thank you so much lewis it's a pleasure for me too how are you so, doing i'm doing very well and since we last spoke i see you've brought out a book the art of resilience i'd love to start there how do you define resilience resilience is defined as the ability to come back to shape mentally and that's exactly what the bhagavad gita is teaching mm. if you have a metal which bends it is considered resilient to the extent it can come back to shape so circumstances situations in our life put us in difficult conditions fear is caused by a gap between expectation and reality and when we are faced with the realities which do not match our expectations many times people they break so therefore to the extent a metal is resilient to that extent it will bend and not break like a, something which is brittle so therefore that's the whole idea how we can actually uh, create that kind of an attitude within the minds of people so that they can have the highest ambitions but still be flexible enough to face the reality and have the enthusiasm to have fresh expectations why do you refer to resilience as an art is it because it's a, a really tough skill to develop resilience is dependent on how we approach the entire concept of controlling our mind just like some people have better control over cars some people have better control over you know uh, laptops and smartphones so there are different uh, levels of expertise involved in that so similarly when we are speaking of resilience we are speaking about ability to control our own mind and so across the world people are going through challenges and difficulties and uh, the statistics are showing that i was just sharing in a seminar a few days ago that Microsoft did a study between 2012 and 2017 and found that the human attention span has come down from 12 seconds to almost 8 seconds the number of internet users has grown you know from 400 million in 2000 to almost 4.62 billion in 2020 and uh, distraction is causing american businesses you know almost 650 billion dollar losses every year 64% of car accidents are happening because of distraction so people are thinking that our economies and our technologies are becoming more and more robust but the question is yes the technology is becoming quite robust and strong but what about the human beings are they also becoming equally strong or are they becoming more brittle than ever before so 300 million people across the world experiencing stress symptoms and mental health disorders 
370 suicides happening every single day in India. So, you know, it is an art because it needs to be, uh, it's a science and it is an art. It's a science because there is a method to it. And it's an art because there is a lot of scope for uh, improvising and perfecting it depending on different flavors which people have. You mentioned uh, distraction there. Um, obviously, I think it's going to continue to become more and more of a problem in this in this digital age where you know you can get everything at your fingertips in a matter of seconds. No one wants to wait around anymore. What are some of the ways that the individual can combat distraction? Is it maybe taking up something like mindfulness? Yeah. So basically, I refer to the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna says, Yoga Stakur Karmani, Sangam Tyaktva Dhananjaya, Siddhya Siddhyo Samo Bhutva Samatvam Yoga Uchchati. All of us have duties to perform, but how do we become equipoised, balanced in our duty without being attached to be winning or losing? Turn your work into yoga as the learned sages do. So, all of us are used to working with some motivation. The whole idea of resilience is transforming your motivation with which you are actually trying to engage in this activity. So four levels of motivation is first fear. If fear is driving my actions, then I'm influenced by the mode of ignorance. And that is going to have severe repercussions in the form of anxiety and stress and destructive tendencies. If desire is my motivation, I'm influenced by the mode of passion. And it is symptomized by constant anxiety, you know, the stress to compete and defeat and to be totally bewildered and to be distressed to see someone else's progress. And then if we are inspired or have a motivation of duty, then we are influenced by the mode of goodness. And at the level of goodness is where we will actually experience some kind of calmness and peace. So the whole idea of meditation as described in the Bhagavad Gita is to help people come to the level of goodness at least, sense of duty. And then above the sense of duty is the fourth level and the highest level of motivation, which is to be motivated by love, which means service without selfish consideration. Because any kind of sustainable stability is only obtained by a person when they have the right uh, harmonious identity. And especially in the digital age where people are juggling and shuffling and bewildered by multiple identities, some real, some virtual. Therefore, the greatest crisis human beings experience is identity crisis. You have a certain identity, you have a certain idea of who I am. And as circumstances change, your identity changes and you do not know what to do with it. Like, for example, a student may think, I'm a brilliant student. That may be his identity. But for some reason in a particular exam, you know, the questions don't come the way he expects or he has not prepared himself or whatever. And he fails the exam. So his identity is, I'm a brilliant student. But the result is showing I have failed. So when he compares, I'm brilliant with I have failed, he is going through an identity crisis. And therefore, he is split between these two identities. And the root cause of depression is this paralysis in thinking because of misplaced identities. Similarly, one of the biggest challenges the youth is facing today is relationship crisis. You develop a relationship with someone and uh, you have an identity that this person loves me. 
and then suddenly in some time you realize that person has started a relationship with someone else so then you have this identity oh i thought i love him or i love her and then but the reality shows this person loves someone else or has a relationship with someone else then this conflicting identity creates so much of an a paralysis paralysis in the thinking paralysis in emotions and therefore people have a tendency to go into depression therefore the place to improve the world is first in our heart head and hands because new goals don't deliver new results new lifestyles do and lifestyle is not an outcome it's a process so we encourage people to build better habits and not just chase better results because the cause of your good habits fair in the present but the cost of your bad habits are in the future and three things money cannot buy first is fitness you have to keep fit whether you are rich or not second is your diet you cannot have you, you know you cannot pay someone to go on a diet for you and third is spiritual discipline no one can you know you cannot delegate someone to take care of your soul and your purpose but you have to do it so discipline is the fusion of intention with action foods add to our physical weight thoughts add to our mental weight so we have to choose both carefully so that's the whole idea making the right choices carefully you say uh in your book that work becomes workload when the mind is overwhelmed with negativity is it important to whatever we're trying to achieve to keep reminding ourselves of the main purpose behind why we're doing it yes if you see the context of the bhagavad gita also arjuna was a great powerful warrior extremely skilled all our education system is focused on improving our skills mm-hmm. and the you know underlying paradigm in everyone's mind is if i become more skilled then i can use my skill to overcome any kind of situation but that is the reason why the one of the most skilled and successful archers like arjuna was brought in the midst of two armies a very familiar territory it was his own profession he could have just fought with his eyes closed because he had won millions of battles in the past but on that particular day arjuna saw his grandfather and he saw his own teacher on the opposite side and so he suddenly was caught between three identities as a warrior i am supposed to kill as a grandson i am supposed to love as a student i am supposed to respect the teacher so these multiple conflicting identities paralyzed him and he could not make a decision because he knew what to fight for and uh, he knew what a fight is he knew how to fight but he did not know why to fight and therefore uh, krishna spoke the famous classic the bhagavad gita basically the context of the battlefield is very relevant because all of us are faced with battles every moment in life and what's the battle we are facing the battle we are facing is the battle of making the right choices every moment to the extent the context keeps changing the pace and the rate at which context keeps changing we have to be able to make the right choices within those changing contexts and therefore we need a, a substratum uh, of foundation which does not change even when circumstances change and that is why krishna spoke to arjuna that in spite of all these changing identities understand that you are a soul and that soul never changes and the soul is not hindu muslim christian jewish soul is not you know indian american russian the soul is soul so therefore without coming to the level of the soul you can go on speculating ad infinitum and write a million self help books but at the end of the day at when death comes the soul leaves the body and goes into another body and therefore the bhagavad gita does not believe in beating around the bush the bhagavad gita very categorically states that the soul 
is eternal. It is trapped within this body. At the time of death, the soul moves to another body. We have the ability to decide how to plan not just this life, but also plan on our life after death, depending on what kind of thoughts we manage to have. So that's the essence. So it is all purpose driven and it is extremely uh, fascinating to see how this can be very practically done by all of us. One of the main issues that a lot of people have with motivation is they get really motivated for the first couple of weeks and then their motivation just seems to dip off. What tools can we use to sustain motivation? I think the most powerful uh, motivating factor is to be with or under someone who is highly motivated. Mm. So nowadays we are in the online world. So we may think that we can remain motivated by being connected with someone online. That may work for some time, but it is not sustainable. You know, the most powerful a factor in transformation of habits and behavior is direct association. And that association is compared to fire. When the iron rod is put in fire, the iron rod becomes molten. So therefore that association has the power to transform. So even if someone is super lazy or not at all motivated, but if he comes in contact with someone who is and he has a little bit of inclination in that direction, then that spark of motivation will uh, immediately blaze into an inferno. So that is the most powerful factor. We've mentioned resilience and motivation. What are some of the main things that stop people from fulfilling their true potential or reaching their goals? One of the most important factors which prevents people from reaching their goals is they do not consider or plan for long-term goals. Mm. So therefore, Mahabharat says, Ahar nidra bhaya maithunam cha samana etat pashubir naranam dharmo hitesham adhiko vishesho dharme nahina pashubi samana Animals have certain goals, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. And if human society also sticks to those goals only, it doesn't make us different than the animals. Therefore, only human society has the ability to ask the question about ethics, about values, about long-term goals and plans what should be done, what should not be done, discrimination. And therefore, if you see a cow or a horse can keep grazing all day, eight to 10 hours, animals can go on searching for food or eating food and continue to nibble. But human beings, they finish the eating business within half an hour to one hour between breakfast, lunch and dinner. So why the human beings are designed like that? Because the human beings are designed to question the ultimate purpose of life and spend time on that and not spend time on just making arrangements for eating, sleeping, waiting and defending. Mm. So therefore, that makes the human beings very special. So if a, you know, if a, a Porsche is used to you know, carry loads to transport, it is not fulfilling the design of the Porsche vehicle. A truck is supposed to carry loads. Uh, an airplane is supposed to fly. So every vehicle has its design and meant for a certain kind of purpose. So therefore people are unable to fulfill their goals because number one, they have no idea what their real goals are and they are sticking to short-term goals. And in that anxiety of the short-term goals, they are not able to achieve those also. So therefore, you have to go top down and then understand what is my long-term goal beyond this life till the time of death 
and from now till death how do i plan my life and then you know that will be the most harmonious uh, life balance do you believe that happiness is a choice that we can make yes basically it is described ramante yogino anante satyananda chidatmani itaram pade naso param brahma vidiyati there are five levels of happiness first is sensual happiness i see a beautiful form you feel happy right uh you know then you see someone else coveting that same you know person so then the same eyes become very morose so it is temporary you see a sweet you see a piece of cake you feel attracted and you place the cake on your tongue expecting happiness but if the cook has forgotten to mix sugar in the cake it will taste bitter miserable so and even if it is good it only is good for that moment so the lowest level of happiness is sensual happiness it is temporary it is fleeting you know so you cannot feel satisfied today because of what you have eaten yesterday you can't just close your eyes and think oh wow i had a great pizza yesterday oh it is so delicious it is filling my belly you need that today and for that moment only higher than uh, sensual happiness is mental happiness mental or emotional where you know you have the sense of art music drama literature so that also absorbs people and it lasts for a longer time and when people do get absorbed in this thing they forget even sensual items when someone is get someone gets absorbed in composing music they forget eating they forget sleeping so it's higher higher than sensual happiness and mental happiness is intellectual happiness joy which arises out of problem solving you know coding and uh, playing various kinds of intellectual games which absorbs the intellect people playing chess they they can sit for hours sometimes not moving at all you know it may appear two statues are sitting but they are intellectually absorbed they are getting some pleasure higher than intellectual is the fourth level which is egoistical pleasure the pleasure one gets in controlling someone or defeating someone or feeling that i am in control of the situation and therefore even though two people develop a relationship and spend time with each other but then after some time when the ego takes over you know uh, in relationship so many divorces and so many breakups are happening because people are choosing the egoistical pleasure over the sensual pleasure so there is some pleasure involved in that oh this person is not doing what i want them to do okay i won't have the relationship anymore so you may think oh are they renouncing that pleasure no they are choosing the ego pleasure over the sensual pleasure and therefore higher than all of this is the spiritual pleasure which is the fifth and the highest so therefore the spiritual pleasure so if you compare sensual pleasure mental intellectual egoistical pleasure all of this is just like equivalent to 100 pounds total if you put all of this together and spiritual pleasure is equal to 100 million pounds and that's why those who are following spiritual pursuits are connoisseurs of pleasure searching for the highest pleasure so that is the also the reason why very few people are into serious, serious spiritual pursuit because the stakes are very high okay in in your book you say that today's world suffers from uh comparing complaining criticizing do you right. think that we tend to 
naturally blame the external world and everyone else first before we look within. Yes. All of us have tendency to do four kinds of things. We have a tendency to control, to consume, to convince, to compete. And we are constantly trying to do that. So the whole idea of writing this book, Art of Resilience, is to inspire people to choose the best conflict. And that is the conflict over our own mind and to make an effort to defeat our mind. And uh, when you realize that, then you stop looking outside, but then you focus on what can be done within. And there is a lot of work within. The problem is no one is looking inside. Once you look inside, you'll find a ton of you know, work available for you to control your mind, senses, emotions. And therefore, you know, uh, we should be competing with our own versions of ourselves and try to get become better versions of ourselves. And that's the whole idea of art of resilience. Do you think that, I think for me personally, over the last year, I've spent a lot of my time worrying about the future, um, thinking about the past. Do you think it's better for our happiness to focus on the present? It basically is the idea of meditation. So therefore, it is not so easy to just, uh, you know, decide I'm going to focus on the present from now. It requires practice. It requires a tremendous amount of commitment. And once we commit to the process of meditation in the right association, we engage our body, mind and senses over a period of time, gradually the speed at which the mind is racing and taking us along like a wild, untamed racehorse. The mind can gradually be controlled. So therefore for controlling the mind, it is recommended that just like a racehorse, you can't just pull the strings all at once, you know. So the racehorse will get so stunned, it will just lift its front legs up and throw the rider off. So to slow down the horse, you need to sometimes, you know, curb it and sometimes allow it. Then curb it and then allow it. So that's the recommended process. Then do things in a regulated manner. And uh, regulate four things. Yukta Ahara, your diet. Yukta Vihara, your recreation. Yukta Cheshta, your work. And your Swapna, that means your sleep and your rest. So once you regulate these, gradually the mind can be brought under control within this context of regulating all of these. In terms of stillness, we've talked about meditation. For someone who's never done it before, for someone who's brand new, where can they start? Because I think when people think of meditation, they instantly think they have to sit down for hours on end, being quiet, maybe like yourself. But where can they start? Can they start with maybe just you know a few minutes at a time? Definitely. When you begin with Instagram, you begin with a few followers only, right? <laughs> yeah. But you still start. Mm. so just like you start your social media in a small way you can always start your meditation in a small way mm. and uh, a few minutes of meditation so the mantra I chant is called the Hare Krishna mantra Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare so that is known as the Maha Mantra and that meditation I also began with the uh, probably 10 minutes of repeating this mantra. So mantra by definition means that which frees the mind, uh, liberates the mind from anxiety and stress, reconnects the soul to its original uh, nature. So therefore, uh, anybody who's interested can start in a small way and then gradually grow. Um, we've mentioned... Bhagavad Gita a few times today for people listening now who maybe who maybe aren't religious can they still get something out of reading yes of course Bhagavad Gita is basically an antivirus software hmm. 
when you have a computer which has virus, then you need an antivirus software to clean the disk. So the hard disk, once it's corrupted, then it needs cleaning. So therefore, the body is like a computer. Mind is like a hard disk. Bhagavad Gita is an antivirus software. Go for it. What is your favorite lesson from the Bhagavad Gita? My favorite lesson is when Krishna says, Tantitiksha Subharata Matras Parshas to Kaunteya, Shita Ushna Sukadukkada Agama Apaino Anitya. Krishna says, What is the meaning of tolerance? Tolerance means to expect that when there is an interaction between senses and the sense objects, there will be 50% chance of joy and 50% chance of distress. So when you are expecting something, you become more efficient. A fireman sitting in a you know, fire brigade office, when the phone rings and he picks up the phone, what is he expecting? What will be the message from the other side? Hey, our building is on fire. Right? He's not going to say, he's not going to expect someone saying, hey, I've got a great pizza to share with you. No. So if you are sitting in a fire brigade office and you're picking up the phone, it means that you're going to hear there is fire. So he's expecting it. When you're expecting something, you train for it. So Krishna is saying that the world is designed in such a way that whenever the eyes are interacting with form, the ear is interacting with sound. Why do you always think that I will only hear sound which will give me pleasure? Which means someone will come and say, oh, you are so great, you are so wonderful. I really appreciate what you are doing. So I like hearing that. But Gita is saying, Are Baba, 50% chances are you will hear criticism also. That is by design. So when you expect that, then you are able to accept the reality faster. So expecting the right things helps in facilitating the acceptance of reality. That's the message of the Bhagavad Gita, which I like. I have two questions left. The first question, how do you personally deal with conflict? Maybe in relationships, friendships. I think that it's really easy when there's conflict to maybe say things you don't mean or react too quickly. What is the best way to deal with conflict? The best way to deal is be careful in choosing the conflict. Hmm. Because if you, I mean, you're from England, right? The UK, yeah. Yeah, the UK. So, you know, when you're playing cricket, you don't always have to hit every ball. <laughs> Or if you're playing baseball, you can always leave some balls. Mm. So anything which is thrown my way, I don't always, uh, you know, consider that it is my duty to catch it. Mm. I can always leave it. Move aside, step aside. So therefore, when we have uh, such a scenario in life where 24 by 7 things are happening around us, we have limited time and limited energy, so we have to choose our battles very wisely. We have to choose our conflicts very wisely. And second, if you have chosen to, uh, if you have chosen the conflict, then you have to consider your own competence level and your own conviction and your own commitment. So if you do not have, if you neither have the conviction, nor the commitment, nor the competence, then uh, you're simply entering the conflict to get uh, finished. The last question I have for you today, this show is called The Freedom Pact. What does freedom mean to you? Freedom means the ability to choose. Swatantrata Ratna. So freedom of choice is the only property of the soul. All of us have the ability to choose our decisions, our opinions, our, you know, uh, our various lifestyles. So therefore, 
all of this information available on the internet and the wisdom available in the ancient texts should help us be more informed in making the right choices, which would help us elevate our consciousness, transform our lives, and transform the lives of the world around us. For everyone listening now, uh, where can they find you on social media? Um, maybe your website and where can they find out more about the book, The Art of Resilience? Uh, about the book, you can find on the Amazon and also on my uh, website, gorangadas.com and also on my Facebook page, Gorangadas Official, uh, Instagram, same Gorangadas Official and YouTube. Amazing. Well, Gorangadas, thank you so much for joining me for a second time on the podcast. It's always a pleasure to speak to you. I hope we get to speak again in the future. Thank you so much, Lewis. Have a great day. Thank you, sir.